So Sage, I want to thank you so much for coming on today and being willing to share a little bit more about your story. I'm going to provide everybody links to your channel in the description box below. I know that's the best place to find you on your YouTube channel. So I want to discuss with you today your testimony and some of the topics are related to it, the topics surrounding it. And I want to hand the floor over to you now to just begin wherever you see fit. Yes, well, testimony has definitely been a, a lifelong journey, as with, I'm sure, other people where mine was a little different. I didn't actually grow up in a Christian home necessarily. I mean, sure, I was baptized Roman Catholic whenever I was a baby, um, but that was just kind of par the course with my mom's Filipino culture. It's like, hey, when you come out of the womb, get baptized because they wanted to you know, just kind of run of the course. But um, I wasn't ever really raised in necessarily a, Christ or a Christian or even a Catholic household because um, I think I maybe went to church once a year for midnight mass and midnight mass in the Catholic religion. That's like the cherry on top of all, <laughs> all celebrations of Christ. And other than that, we never really prayed at the dinner table, prayed over our food, nothing like that. So I was raised in honestly more, a more secular type of home overall. Um, but with my upbringing, I, my parents were in the military. And so my dad and my mom had met in Hawaii before my siblings and I were born. And even though they weren't necessarily religious, they still very much appreciated culture. And in Hawaii, you know, they, they call it the aloha spirit, right? Where it's like, everybody's just all about community and love and just um, celebrating the culture and all that they've been blessed with, right? And so even though for my family and I, we didn't live in Hawaii for not even a year, <laughs> but my fam my parents had met there and fell in love, got married, had me, then my siblings, and then decided, okay, well, we want our children to carry the culture with them, regardless of where we're moving to, because we moved around a lot being a military family. And it was just one of those things where that's what I knew. It's like, no matter where we went, we found the Polynesian community <laughs> on these different military bases. And my sister and I, we were so blessed because we got to learn a lot about the cultures of the different, um, you know, not, not only of Hawaii, but also of New Zealand, also of Tahiti and all the different dances and um, cultural myths that were associated with them. And it was so cool. We were just like, wow, look at all these different expressions of how these different cultures essentially did storytelling through dance and through um, the different ways that they made sense of their world. And so that's what I grew up with. That was essentially, I guess, my form of spirituality is that it was my dance. It was, you know, dance being able to tell stories of, you know, the a love that a, a man had for a woman. And that's his love story <laughs> dance, you know, or even um, witnessing people in, um, what we call a halal in your group, in your halal, where, you know, the boys would learn how to do the haka, which was a warrior's chant and dance that they did. And it's so incredibly powerful. And so that was spirituality for me. But even throughout that time, that was my, I guess, spiritual underlying upbringing. Um, my sister and I also went to the Philippines, you know, to go at least, you know, meet my mom's family, because we'd never been to the Philippines. And I was five years old at the time and, you know, you drop a kid, an American kid into the jungles of the Philippines on an island, <laughs> never been there before. Um, within a week, unfortunately, I had gotten very sick and literally gotten like 103 degree fever. I don't know if it was the water. I mean, it could have been a lot of things, but my mom was from a very, very little island <laughs> in the Philippines where any, you know, any hospital was literally a two hour ferry ride across the ocean. And so here I am, you know, sick, obviously, at 103 degree fever that wouldn't break for mm. literally our two hours at that point. And my mom obviously didn't know what to do. She's like, if we take a ferry in the middle of the night right now, are we going to even make it? <laughs> and so, um, as far as at that time, you know, my aunt had suggested to my mom, hey, maybe we should call our local village Abulario, which in the Philippines, an Abulario is a witch doctor that, or medicine man, right? That heals people 
in that particular region. And, and that still exists today. Do you know what I mean? Like that still exists today to where it's um, an accessible, helpful person to them, right? That is helpful for people that can't afford to go to a medical hospital. And so it still exists, right? But an avaladio had came and literally, it was the most craziest thing, <laughs> and came in, you know, dressed in what you would picture a shaman would look like, you know, in our particular uh, frame of reference, and literally just started crushing a bunch of herbs in a mortar and pestle, you know, started talking to my mom about me having some kind of spirit attached to me. And um, he called him, called it an, an encanto. In the Philippines, they're called encanto. So they call them like nature fairies or um, elves because in the Philippines, a lot of their beliefs are more animistic. I mean, outside of Christianity and Catholicism that came there. And so he had spoken all these different chants above me in Latin, rubbed these herbs on my chest, and literally in an hour, I was fine all of a sudden, right? Um, after we came back from the Philippines back to America, that's when my supernatural kind of experiences began, where all of a sudden now I had these very... Um, scary dreams of different, you know, spirits talking to me and, you know, hearing different things, even my awakened life. And just, I wondered, okay, I don't know what's happening, but I couldn't make sense of it. Right. <laughs> but I kind of just lived life like that was normal because I didn't know any better. I was a young kid, you know, and young kids have imaginary friends, right? <laughs> like some of the imaginary friends when they're little, that was kind of like the equivalent of what my parents had talked it up to. But that was essentially my childhood. And then, you know, had pursued still Polynesian dance. And um, like I said, had this secular upbringing with some kind of Polynesian Philippine spiritual um, underlying theme. But then once I got to college is when I went to school for cultural anthropology. And that's where my specialty um, that or specialty interest I took on was in yes, studying cultural dances, but also spirituality across cultures. And so I approached my college career from a very intellectual standpoint, um, but then much more had opened in the world, just like it happens at a university, you learn about all kinds of different things. And I started to become very interested in paganism, right? And I had no reference, like, like I said before, to um, really Christianity or the Bible or anything like that. I just said, wow, look at there's different cultures around the world who think similarly that um, to what I had been exposed to, you know, like, oh, different gods and goddesses and, um, you know, spirit living in the land, <laughs> like how the Polynesians had believed. Yep. And, and it was an interesting thing that that had bred into thinking, oh, okay, I wonder if paganism exists in modern day. And lo and behold, of course it did, you know, it never ends. It just kind of takes on different forms. And um, it became today what's called what we call neo-paganism. And so I ended up doing my my bachelor's thesis on neo-paganism here in Las Vegas, where I live. And ended up finding a community of um, really great people, wonderful people, don't get me wrong. Um, and they literally had, you know, different circles and covens and communities that had been here well over 20, 30 years in Las Vegas. I had no idea. And thankfully, they gave me the time of day to study them for my thesis. And um, yeah, that was my intellectual interest in this side of the spiritual world. But um, that intellectual interest began to really take on more of a personal one in my like last year of college during that time where, yes, I had this intellectual interest in this form of spirituality, but then I was also going through a really hard time in life where, you know, at the time I was going through a very tumultuous marriage um, that later, you know, came to a divorce. But it was just when, ta when life gets hard, when times get tough, what do we reach to, right? It's like the testing of our spirit. <laughs> what are we going to reach to? And that's what I had to reach to. And so that intellectual interest became a personal one where those communities had welcomed me in, you know, and really just wanted to, yes, genuinely be able to help me. But like, during that time, I learned a lot of different things, you know, about uh, rituals, about celebrating the, 
the sabbats on the wheel of the year, um, you know, metaphysics through like crystal healing, different forms of magic, and also seeing how much neo-paganism and new age intertwined in that world. It's like, oh, okay, you guys practice Celtic, uh, Celtic witchcraft, but you also like Buddhist practices. That's very interesting. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, just, I really just dove in headfirst into a personal interest in it for a good six years, a good six years to where I decided also then, okay, I'm going to go do a priestess training. I'm going to go train with other women in the community to be able to uh, be of help to the community and did that for 13 months to where, you know, they had a whole community here that witnessed my ordination as a priestess at the Sekhmet Temple here in Nevada. And so when I say I was like living this, I was in it. <laughs> Pull on, did not ever bat an eyelash thinking that I would ever see any other path for myself in life or anything like that. And and it's such an interesting world to be in, whether you call it, you know, the neo-pagan, new age, witch, witchcraft circles. It's very intertwined with a lot of different stuff, even with like feminism. It's super intertwined with a lot of that. And so I really just kind of walked in life for a good, you know, six years of my adult life, really kind of just claiming this, you know, witchy, mystical, feminist priestess kind of <laughs> embodiment, which in, of course, in hindsight, I'm like, wow. How egotistical was I? <laughs> but, you know, that that was where I was at. It's it's like I took on that personal interest to try to, in some sense, find healing from the divorce I was going through. You know, to feel like I was feeling empowered again, feeling some kind of reclamation to myself, which I think that a lot of people tend to get um, enchanted and find that alluring um, draw to the new age or pagan practices or even witchcraft because it's like it gives us this sense of of power or we think is power <laughs> and so that was my life for a good chunk of it I went through a divorce was you know a single mom for a good two years before then meeting my now husband who literally confronted every single thing that I did not know how to deal with in life, which was, you know, meeting a man who was very traditionally masculine and very much a godly man. And, you know, a man that wanted to, you know, take care of his wife, have children, you know, be able to create a stable and loving home, very much living these biblical principles that and I, I sat there coming to the table of you know I'm like this feminist you know witchy woman and I had no idea how to even level with a man like that and um, I think you know a lot of women that are maybe coming from that side too they tend to be challenged with like how to even work and partner with men in this day and age because of a lot of the you know stuff today with feminism <laughs> it's just like okay well you know women are choosing you know career and you know really just kind of these more wor worldly pursuits or um nothing wrong with those things right but it's like a lot of at least for me i did not know how to be with a man like that <laughs> but i was i was gracious and just saying you know what I could have a lot to learn here and literally just kept surrounding myself with not only him, but of just essentially the godly men and women that he surrounded himself with in life. And then I understood finally what it was like to work with men. They weren't the enemy, right? Like all of this, you know, stuff that I had learned and kind of more of that neo-pagan witchy feminist world I was like, wow, there are good men out there. There are, you know, good men and women out there who want to be able to, you know, take care of their children, have a healthy marriage, you know, create a stable and loving um, home, which, you know, it was a, a great thing for me to learn. And so I think just seeing the love and all that is what helps me kind of like, okay, I'm, I'm fine with this. I can, I can learn from this. But um, then during that time, during the pandemic, you know, because he and I were only together for maybe what, six months before the pandemic hit? <laughs> and so pandemic hit. And of course, you know, for many of us, life got hard. 
in a variety of ways and um, the ways that a lot of us, you know, coped with it, um, found ways to get through it. None of my witchcraft rituals, um, ceremonies, nothing was working anymore. And especially when times got hard where, you know, my husband and I were like, okay, well, let's try to have children of our own where we realized, okay, things weren't happening naturally. I was sitting there trying to do spell work and blood magic and literally sex magic and all that to try and manifest a child all to no avail, obviously. <laughs> and so um, it was one of those things where I think for me, I just got to a point where I said, you know what, is this really working? is this really like serving me all of these things that I'm doing? And I had a period of time where I did just stop all of it. And I tried maybe going back to the Catholic church. I went with my mom <laughs> a handful of times and I was like, no, this isn't, no, I don't know. I'm not sure. Still kind of dipping my toes in and out. But then literally just one day, what was it last year, November, a girlfriend of mine had um, invited me out to her born again Christian church, not too literally 10 minutes away from my house. Didn't know it existed. And I was scared walking in, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to walk in. I'm just going to burn a lie. <laughs> I'm going to throw holy water on me and I'm going to burn. But it was nothing like that, obviously. And I was welcomed and loved with such open arms for who I was. But just knowing, um, them knowing that I was lost. I was 100% lost. And that just, I said, you know what? Nothing else is working. Why not give Jesus a try? <laughs> and it has been the single most best decision that I've made in my life. Cause I never knew, I don't really know Jesus my entire life. Like, okay, maybe in baptism and whatnot. And once a year at midnight mass growing up, but not having a relationship with Jesus, you know, and, and with God, like I've been developing now and granted, I'm still very much in a sanctification process. I, I know that the Holy Spirit is working on my mind and my heart, but um, in a nutshell, yes, that has been my testimony up until this point. There is just a lot to it, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, there's really a lot to flesh out there. So it sounds like you come from this uh, this sort of traditionally Catholic background, but it's more of a traditional thing rather than a real lived faith experience for you. You have these supernatural experiences when you're younger, and then uh, this interest in dance and culture and cultural anthropology leads into sort of an academic pursuit for you, which introduces you to this neo-pagan environment. And one of the things that I found really interesting is that you were seeking healing. And you also mentioned that word power. And these are things that seem to be really, really common for particularly women entering the new age movement. And it's interesting that you mentioned also the link between uh, some of these practices and feminism. And um, there's just so much to unpack. What, would right you like, to, yeah, it, it's actually hard to decide exactly where to go. I suppose one question I had is what made you open to the idea that these things were real and not just something that you were studying from an academic perspective? How did you sort of have the openness to begin exploring that? I think for me, you know, and obviously starting from a very intellectual interest in it and just seeing it all very objectively is I, I looked at that world and I said, wow, this is an interesting expression of connecting to something beyond the human self. Right. Mm. And, um, and, and one thing that I realized is I said, wow, it's almost like, um, an, an enactment of fantasy beyond storytelling. And for me, you know, it was, it was enchanting. It was incredibly enchanting. And it was one of those things too, where people were essentially picking their own adventure in whatever way they wanted to express their particular path, right? You would have, I, I know that there were some people that call themselves pagan Buddhists or someone that would call themselves, um, a Celtic Hindu witch. And I'm like, what does that, that's very interesting. <laughs> but it was, it seemed like it was this very open um, expression to people creating their own truths, essentially. 
And so, but that was just kind of seeing it at that, not surface level, but from that certain perspective. And once I was in there and realizing, okay, got it. All right. There's a lot of different practices and different ways that they do ceremony and ritual, depending on a culture, which, hey, great. They really loved the theatrical parts of it too, which I'm sure, yes, made it more enchanting and fun for people and all that. But um, there was those aspects of, you know, yes, personally developing yourself in those ways. Right. And, but it was overall being in it, it was these chasing of mystical experiences for healing. It was always a chasing of something. And it always felt that way, especially like whether or not it was, we were doing certain rituals on the new moon and then the full moon. And then we, you know, two and a half, three months later, we're celebrating a Sabbath on the wheel of the year. Okay. Beltane's here. We need to do something with that. And just, it was this constant chasing, even though we were telling ourselves, Oh, we're aligning with the cycles of nature. We are aligning with the magic of the cosmos. <laughs> and so, um, but I realized that at least in hindsight now, and I say this with love because I, I do still, you know, just love and respect the people in there, but it just felt like this constant need to escape the human experience through the modalities that we were partaking in. And that's not an easy thing to admit, <laughs> to say, wow, we're so busy escaping the human experience in some way the hard stuff, right? And just trying to dress it up um, in a way that made us feel better about it through magic, through ceremony, through all of those things. And it just turns into another hamster wheel of trying to feel okay and trying to constantly save ourselves, you know? That's huge. And then, and you're using terms like Sabbath, for example. And I think for a Christian uh, audience that's hearing that, it might be useful for you to explain that it's not like the Sabbath that Christians believe in. What is what do those kind of practices look like for you? And what's really the goal of looking at, you know, there's been so many terms that we've used here. Like, for example, I think a lot of people will be familiar with what the new age is, but then things like sex magic, blood magic, moon ceremonies, right? What are the goals of these uh practices, I suppose, and what do they mean for people who aren't familiar with that? Yeah, well, definitely to touch on Sabbaths, because I know that, yes, for especially for different Christians and Catholics and whatnot. That means something very specific. Um, but in the more neo-pagan world, um, well, if you look at Celtic paganism, right? Like historic Celtic, Celtic paganism, they have their will of the year, which was four fire festivals that they would celebrate in their cultures that were essentially agricultural celebrations, right? And so they would have fire festivals, you know, during that time. But in neo-paganism, especially with the onset of Wicca that had happened in the Western culture, there was the Celtic will of the year that now became the Wiccan will of the year, where there's eight seasonal Sabbaths, where they are celebrations that are meant to observe different, um, I guess you'd call it natural phenomena in nature. So it's like you have, you know, uh, Emolk, you have, um, you know, the Litha, you have Beltane, you have all these different Sabbaths to travel through the seasons of nature through a calendar year is essentially what it is. And there's different um, purposes of celebrating during that season, you know, of like, okay, Beltane, Beltane is a time that nature is extremely fertile and is jubilant and uh, uh, prospering and abundant. So we do ceremonies and celebrations to uh, manifest that into our own lives as it is reflected in nature. And so we would just, that's essentially a short-term explanation of what the will of the year is. That's really interesting. And so it seems that a lot of people in these movements are seeking healing. And you also mentioned here that you had a, a real interest in metaphysical uh, studies and metaphysical experiences. And maybe that was something that you were looking into to deal with some of the issues that you were facing in your own life. Did you end up finding what you were looking for? Because one of the things that I found really interesting, actually, as I was listening to your story again for the second time last night in preparation for this podcast, is the fact that the fever does leave you right after you see that shaman in the Philippines. And for Christians, that presents, it's interesting, right? Because to acknowledge the nuance that sometimes these practices do work for people in the moment, even if they're ultimately bad, is uh, a difficult thing to do, right? 
And I'm wondering if you could maybe shed some light on that. Like, how did your experience of the metaphysical play out? Did you have some real experiences? And how do you understand that now? I'm sorry, that's a really big topic to just hand over to you. But I'm very interested to hear your answer. Yeah, yeah, no, and and really just to kind of um, uh, answer to, for example, the witch doctor in the Philippines, right? And did I feel like I received healing from that? It's interesting looking at it in hindsight because I didn't even think about it at all until obviously when I was repenting for my practices, burning all my things and reflecting on, okay, why do I not have these different psychic experiences anymore? My dreams were different, right? Um, things had changed, but I, in hindsight now, believe that that time with the witch doctor and that healing, I say that in quotations with my fingers, <laughs> that I'd received, that I I didn't think I had anything cleared for me. I think I had something else put in me. Because if you look at various spiritual practices, you know, it's like, oh, you cannot leave an empty vessel. It must be filled with something, Right. And so I do 100% think that something was filled in that place to thus started giving me these different supernatural experiences, these different psychic abilities that began to pan out through my childhood that once I became an adult, you know, started getting into this community and then started learning about, you know, witchcraft and neo-paganism and then also different metaphysical practices that they started to, um, especially with different psychic gifts, you know, you have things like clairvoyance, clairtangency, clairaudience and all that. It was like, oh, this is making sense of these gifts that I have, right? <laughs> They're helping me. Um, and granted, I think that they were, sure, they were helping me cope with the fact that I had no other idea what to do with these things. I couldn't make them go away, or so I thought I couldn't make them go away. But in hindsight, do I think that they actually helped me? No, absolutely not. Because I felt it just kept me um, feeling like, oh, I need to listen to every voice in my head. I need to, you know, and, and it creates almost this type of psychosis. <laughs> A lot of the times for somebody whenever um, they just don't know what to do, but in realizing, okay, never asking myself, where were these gifts coming from, right? Where were they coming from? And I never got an eyelash at it until obviously I'd repented and burned all my things and literally just started praying to the Holy Spirit, Spirit and saying, anything that is not meant to be in me, please help me rebuke it, help it, send it away, you know? And then having that happen to where it's like, oh, wow, okay, I don't hear any of these things anymore. I don't have strange dreams anymore. And so I think that a lot of those different practices and those metaphysical things, whether it's, you know, chakra healing, crystal healing, all those different things, I think that it's like, sure, people are trying to engage with them to help them cope with something. It doesn't have to be, you know, the supernatural things that I had. It could be like, hey, they have a lot of challenges with depression, you know, or anxiety or suicide, you know, and it's like people are trying to find something so that they don't feel like they're going crazy. But in essence, engaging with these things, you're just engaging in a hamster wheel of crazy because you keep constantly trying to heal yourself because it's so works-based. It's like you never find that, um, I guess you could say that, that enlightenment that you're looking for, that, that pinnacle of peace or being okay um yeah i mean and granted i don't throw like this might not be a popular opinion but i don't i don't throw every like everything out you know the baby with the bathwater because there are things like from let's say um like eastern traditions for example like homeopathy right or like chinese medicine <laughs> and all these different things and i could say okay well those things definitely did help me with certain health problems but as far as the, the spiritual stuff no, it kept me in a very interesting hamster wheel and cycle of needing to engage with it all the time. That's interesting. And so, 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 yeah, sorry, sorry to cut you off. So, so that experience you had actually, you do notice a shift with after seeing that shaman. You mentioned your dreams change and things like that. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah. So, 
it's funny because my um my husband whenever he had met me obviously i was still very much in witchcraft neo-paganism and whatnot and i would always have just these very interesting dreams of being i always would call it um when I went to sleep, it was like I was a satellite dish for things that were not in the awake world. <laughs> and I never asked for it. It just kind of happens. Um, but he was also very similar as well. We didn't know that whenever we met. But he has a whole nother story to that <laughs> that is to share. But yeah, I would see just various um, things. I would get certain prophetic visions of maybe something that was happening with my sister who lives like, you know, four hours away. And then I'd call her in the middle of the night and she's like, oh yes, I was having this spiritual experience and you saw it. <laughs> and so just really um, not anybody that was in the new age would be like, that's so cool. You're having all these like spiritual dreams and experiences. And, you know, I would sit there and say, I don't want these dreams, but I'm trying to make sense of them because I can't stop them, you know? And so I don't know if that helped to answer your question per se, but um, they were always just seeing other things that weren't of this immediate world. And they yeah. weren't ever else. Now that makes complete sense. And I think in listening to one of your other videos, I can't remember exactly which one it was last night. I, I think there's been a shift in your dreams and I think even your husband's dreams too, since you've come to faith. Could you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for my my husband and I, cause he, like I said, I know he has his own story, but he, um, you know, it's funny because he didn't ever consider himself Christian when we met, even though he was very traditionally masculine and what I consider to be a godly man. He was just like, oh, I'm just kind of like whatever, walking through life. But then he had these different experiences too <laughs> um, in his dream state to where um, – we sometimes would cross stream, you know, and, and people in the new age would say, oh, that is, um, what do you call it? Uh, like lucid dreaming, but you guys are meeting in the, uh, what is it called? More of the etheric realm. <laughs> yeah. dreams. So we're trying to make sense of these different things, but um, he would see certain beings that I would see in my dreams. And so we still are trying to come to terms with that of why we could see the same things in our dream state. Um, and I think a lot of people, you know, that go to new age and all that, they're just like trying to make sense of these crazy things that happened to them. And um, for us, it was like, oh, okay, well, we must be just meeting in the etheric realm, you know, lucid dreaming together. <laughs> and we're meeting different things while we're there. And we don't want to meet them, but we don't know how to not meet them. And so, yeah, that's what was happening. But that doesn't happen anymore, thankfully. Wow, that's huge. It's it's really interesting that you haven't been experiencing lucid dreaming since becoming a Christian. I experienced that a bit when I was younger, and it really cleared up as an adult. But yeah. certainly dreams are fascinating. We see a biblical basis for dream interpretation, but obviously there is a link to the occult that is definitely unhelpful for some people. And figuring out exactly how to work all of that is still something that I'm personally sort of going through. Uh could yeah. kind of or learning, right? Mm. Of okay, what what is of God and what is not? It's like a different discernment that yes, I'm still in as well. I'm still navigating it. Yeah, exactly. And just because things are strange to us in our sort of materialist Western scientific worldview that we're saturated in, doesn't necessarily mean that it's sinful, right? Like you see uh, Daniel being really invested in dream interpretation. You see the same with Joseph, and you know dreams are certainly an important part of our spiritual life but certainly we need to use discernment as we begin to think about dreams and dream interpretation and um i really like yeah hearing how your story relates to those topics another thing that i think represents a bit of a shift for you even as you were starting to come out of some of these movements is uh, you mentioned feminism before and then finding your husband who was more traditionally masculine and how is that all changing for you now since you've been a christian how has your own view of your identity as a woman shifted has it shifted? How do you reconcile all those different things? Oh, yeah, 100%. It's shifted for sure. Because I think, you know, being very exposed to modern day feminism, you know, we're taught, okay, you know, you got to be independent, you got to be make your own money, you got to be a boss lady, you got to, 
um, not rely on anybody. And, you know, and granted, you know, at the time before I met my husband, I was a single mom. So I legit had to learn how to do that. But there comes to a point where it's like, if you just do that, you'll never learn how to be in relationship in a loving partnership with somebody else. And so it was interesting because it was like learning and going from being a strong woman to a woman of strength. And I think that's really the space that I was learning to be in with um, the people that he had surrounded himself with, because the women that I was meeting, you know, they were Christian women, you know, a lot of them were Christian women. And I was like, this is so interesting. You know, they're women of strength, meaning that they uh, walk with a faith that is unshakable and they are partners with their husbands. They're not, their they're men are not their adversaries. <laughs> You know, it's like they know that it is a is a partnership and divine union. And I think for me, I had to learn what it was to first off, really unlearn what I thought submission was. To unlearn what I thought submission was and actually look at scripture. I think it's so funny. I, I would think all these different things before of, oh, you know, um, I'm not going to be some kind of woman who submits to my husband and be beneath him and all of that. Yet I had no scriptural understanding of what that actually meant. And it's like, wow, okay, you know, a man is, you know, in, in our traditional Christian, you know, biblical sense is like, he is the protector of the home. He is to provide cover and safety and security. Um, and, and the woman is the one who is the nurturer to take care of, um, of, of their children, to protect the children, you know? And so the, there's these different, yes, traditional roles of feminine and masculine, but it's funny, my husband and I were talking about it the other day, is that it took me time to learn those things and value those things because um, it was a lot of mental deprogramming from the world <laughs> that told me that I shouldn't value those things. And, and especially, you know, I mean, we could go off on a tangent on all that and I won't totally won't go there, but, um, just learning to be a woman in strength, to be in partnership with, with your spouse, with your husband, but also under God. It's like, we're not just doing this on our own where, um, it's just about, you know, us and our wants and our needs. It's like, what is our purpose and service here? We're in a world, especially with like, you know, feminism and just and the worldview of it, be, it being very self-oriented and very like, uh, I need to do this for myself and self-love and self-care. It's like all of these different things intertwine to where, um, especially for women, it's like we forgot what it was to lovingly serve. And so, yeah, it's it's a journey that I had to go on for sure. A lot of deprogramming. <laughs> Totally. Yeah. I think uh, that adversarial way that it's been framed in our culture is sort of men versus women rather than us working together towards something else. And even a good that's higher than ourselves and what God has called us to to do together is yeah. is really unhelpful. And I love what you had to say there. So one of the other things, and you, you used the word submission before, and I think that, you know, as a husband, I submit myself to Christ ultimately, and my wife submits herself to Christ. And I'm wondering how your experience has been of coming to Jesus. And, you know, I recently saw a video where you are burning your new age books and you're leaving things behind you that had obviously been really important to you. And I'm sure that that was something that was difficult to do. It was difficult to submit to Christ's Lordship. Maybe you could speak a little bit to that and how it's been for you coming to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior and all the shifts that I'm sure have been going on for both you and your husband. Yeah, um, well, definitely in the realm of of submission to to Christ and also to um, my husband in, in different things, right? It's like he is the head of our household, right? And if you would have asked my, you know, former self, not even five, no, not even like two, three years ago, I would have been like, oh my gosh, don't even bring that to me whatsoever. Um, but I think it's just such a humbling journey together. It's such a humbling journey together. And yes, I mean, I, I, won't, I wouldn't say that letting go of that stuff now is, was hard because I was ready. I was finally ready, you know, and letting go of all of that stuff. But there is actually one book that um, he and I have been enjoy, enjoying reading. It's called Love and Respect. And I forget who the author is, 
but love and respect very much is talking about how to be in, in marriage under Christ, both, you know, it writes to both husbands and wives. And I needed to read that book to understand like, okay, what does it mean to, it's like, I'm, I'm learning life all over again, <laughs> learning life all over again. But it's such a beautiful thing too, because it has brought us both into such a place of service, which it was like before all this, it's like, we were like the world, very self-oriented, you know? And yes, sure, we had our marriage and we had our our um, our family, but it was like, it's such a different worldview to have, such a different worldview to have to um, to just yeah, just appreciate what we both bring to the table and yeah, to the table, <laughs> you know, the value of it. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's a, that's an awesome, healthy shift. And obviously, the most important thing that you know Christ does in our lives is He reconciles us to the Father when we trust in Him, and He gives us new life. And all of these other things are just really side benefits to knowing Jesus and what that means for us eternally. And so, yeah, if you're listening to this and you're in a similar place, I think we'd both encourage you to come to Christ. And it can be a difficult thing at times. It's like it's not all perfect after coming to Jesus, but certainly it's the most important thing that you can do. And on that note, I'm wondering, is there anything you would say to people who are sort of in a place similar to where you were all those years ago when you were involved in neo-paganism and you were, you know, seeking uh, healing in that and you were seeing, you know, you naturally are coming at it from a place where I think the idea of Father God is difficult for a lot of people. The idea of um, submitting particularly to a man can be really difficult for a lot of women. I, I don't blame them. Like I see a lot of what goes on in the culture and if you tell women to submit to some of these guys and place them as a leader in their life, like why on earth would women want to do that? It's beyond me. And I can totally understand that. But so there's been all these shifts for you. And um, so, yeah, what would you say to people who are still in a place that was similar to where you were? Yeah. I mean, I would, I was actually just responding to um, a gal who responded to one of my YouTube videos because she's in a similar place and just, um, I think the first important thing is just not rushing the process for oneself because it is a grieving process. And especially in the beginning when somebody really realizes, okay, I'm not identifying so much with this anymore. And I don't know why. There's a lot of that initial confusion that happens even before the grief comes, right? It's like they're just out sitting there looking at themselves, okay. I don't know why all of these practices aren't resonating with me anymore. And they may get in that space to where they just start now incessantly doing them more and more, trying to reach out to other practices and trying to just grasp for straws at that point to make something work, right? To try and make it work, which I think that I get that. It's like we wanted to have some type of control over our lives. We wanted to have some a uh, sense of agency to where we felt like we could control the outcome, whether it was new age or neo-paganism or whatever it may be. And the reality is, it's like, hey, we're not God. <laughs> we're not God. And, and to um, just be open, you know, and not, I, I keep using this spray throwing the baby out of the bathwater. It's such a terrible analogy, but it's like, you know what I mean? Um, and just staying open to where God might be guiding you. It may not make sense in the moment. It sure did not make sense for me at all. I just kept showing up and not questioning it because I stopped trying to control my life and my outcomes to where I just left it open for spirit the Holy Spirit to really guide me and listen <laughs> and listen. And, um, and it's going to, it's going to happen in different layers for everybody, you know, and even for somebody, for example, that let's say if anybody's watching that is, you know, Christian, but maybe has somebody that they love that's in, you know, more of that new age, neo-pagan lifestyle is one thing that I feel was really helpful for me is to, for them to never forget the value of that person that they love because they're valuing their offenses more than anything. Because that's what ultimately um, 
doesn't pull um, and, and draw people to Christ is that we're so busy, you know, saying how offensive they are <laughs> that we don't create a connection um, to really welcome them in with open arms, like my local church had done with me. Mm. And, you know, to just ultimately pray for them, you know, pray for them that they meet Jesus Christ and accept him as their savior, um, but not to try and corner them and try to like manipulate them or force them to repent, wagging your finger at them, <laughs> right? It's like giving them space, still having a relationship with them and, but being there for them when times get tough, because it's like, we're, we're here to plant seeds. And, and they don't always grow in people's hearts right away. Um, and, you know, mm -hmm. that goes for, even for people, you know, they're leaving the new age. It's like, hey, a seed's been planted. Just be patient, lean in, <laughs> and um, really just stay open to where God might be guiding you because you don't know where that's going to be, but it's definitely not going to be where you thought it was. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. And I think that people can feel if you're not being authentic with them in relationships and you're only there for them because you want to see them convert. And I remember before I was a Christian, I had some friends who, God bless them, they had the best intentions, but I did feel like the only reason they were spending time with me is to try and get me to convert to Christianity. And I don't think that's actually the model, the model that Jesus leaves for us. I think he really did meet people where they were at and showed an authenticity that meant that they wanted Christianity above anything else because it was so much better than the alternatives the world offered. And I think that that's still the case today, right? To really genuinely meet people where they are at and trust God that seeds are being sown without trying to just grab them and <laughs> forcibly <laughs> convert them. Like, um, So maybe we could start to finish up now by talking a little bit about what you're doing on your YouTube channel now. I know you've got some videos out there. And again, I encourage people to check that out. I know you did a video on Lilith and um, you must be thinking through a lot of different things. Maybe just tell us a bit about your ministry now. Yeah, well, you know, what's interesting is that, um, like I said, you know, the Holy Spirit is really working on my mind and my heart. And this is right now for me, it seems like more of a season of quiet rhythms. And so as far as my YouTube, it's funny because it just started with, you know, me sharing with my immediate people in my life and them saying, hey, you should share your story with other people. And so then, okay, I post something to YouTube. And then as I'm going through this journey and studying scripture and finding that certain beliefs that I had before that weren't aligning with not only scripture, but also history, it's like, okay, one of these things is not the same. It does not make sense. Yep. <laughs> I need to make it make sense. And that's just how my brain works. And so yeah, with the stories of Lilith that has absolutely ruffled feathers, you know, and that's fine. I'm okay with that, but I just, I have such a deep personal value of truth. And, and it's like, people don't like that nowadays. <laughs> and, um, and granted with the videos that I share, I'm just kind of sharing them as I go along on my journey. I'm uncovering these different things for myself and even, um, I know one that I do have planned for the future. I don't know what will come um, other than that is literally unpacking the whole idea of St. Patrick and <laughs> Druidism and this whole thing of Christians versus Druids thing that gets perpetuated a lot in the witchcraft world and neo-pagan world. I will be sharing something on that. But other than that, yeah, I'm just going to kind of see what comes up. Because I know that the things that I'm uncovering and trying to um, make make sense, I'm not the only one asking myself these questions. And whether it's Lilith, whether it is, you know, tarot cards and this whole, because um, I know you probably watched my video on that, is like, I was told that the tarot cards was from the Book of Toth and it was this divine thing that had came about. It's like, oh, no. That's not what happened. These are why there are charlatans in the occult. It's all a, all a big charade. <laughs> and it's alluring, but it's false. There's a lot of snake oil in the in the New Age movement. That's that's 100%. Well, I suppose in, in everything there's snake oil, but there's a lot of yeah. false history and a lot of things that are romanticized. And I don't know if I can selfishly ask you a little bit more about Lilith. I actually haven't had the chance to watch that video yet. Maybe you could give people a quick teaser of what ruffled feathers, because that would be pretty interesting. Well, as far as Lilith, especially in more of the New Age and neo-pagan feminist circles, 
Lilith is seen as the first feminist of the Bible in their eyes. The first feminist of the Bible, right? Because somehow it was like, okay, Lilith was the first wife of Adam and she shook her fist at, at God because she didn't want to um, be beneath you know, Adam. <laughs> so um, God had casted her from the Garden of Eden and she became, you know, this uh, child eating creature, blah, blah, blah. There, there's this whole theme around it, right? But in, in the New Age and neo-pagan world, it's like, and even in astrology, Lilith is seen as the, the dark aspect of the feminine. And, it is ce and she's celebrated as a feminist icon, and it's such an interesting thing being on the other side and understanding who Lilith really was, not just biblically, but in like Sumerian Mesopotamian times and people not looking at that or looking at it and not actually taking into account that Lilith was never a feminist icon. She was a demon who ate children. <laughs> and sure, I guess, you know, if, a feminist that, you know, I guess are, you know, pro-abortion and all that, they may be like, oh yeah, I love Lilith. That's great. But to me, I'm like, does anyone see what's really in front of them? With this? Yeah. And so, yeah, that's just the whole thing, but just a touch on that. Um, I, it was a pretty long talk that I did, but I dove deep in it. And even in the Bible, it's like, I don't know where they get these stories from because it's like, there's literally only one line in the Bible that mentions, depending on the translation about the Lilitu, but all of this other stuff is just like you said, um, snake oil, right? It's just all of these kind of created stories that people over generations have seen. Oh, that is true. This, she is in the Bible. She's this and that. I'm like, what is happening? You guys. <laughs> yep. Yeah, absolutely. Look, we're going to link all those videos in the description box below. So people can really see all the work that you've been doing and, Certainly, you know, all in God's timing as you begin to upload more. I'm wondering, is there anything else you wanted to say to the listeners before we sort of wrap up here? And, and thank you again so much for coming on and being willing to share so much. Yeah, no, I, of course, I just appreciate you for having me on today and just um, really grateful to really just allow me to share my experience, but also just the continued humbling walk with Christ. It's a very humble walk that it's still a sanctifying process for each and every single one of us. And um, that, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, even if it has to just be a quiet season of just building a relationship with God, whatever that may be, whatever, you know, it doesn't have to be tomorrow. It's just like, let it take its course, you know, let it take its course. And, um, and to say too, with the, with the Bible, because I know you mentioned uh, Jordan Peterson, right? <laughs> I, I love Jordan Peterson's mindset on different things, but he had spoken on the Bible. Um, I forget which talk it, it was, but he said that, you know, the Bible is true, but in a very strange way, right? It's like, it's true in that it provides the basis for truth itself and that it's like a meta truth, right? Because without the Bible and without that truth, like there couldn't even be a possibility of truth. <laughs> so it's, um, it's one of those things where it's like the Bible provides the preconditions for all judgments of truth in our lives. And so mm -hmm. even just letting that sit in our hearts and our minds of just knowing that, all right, it might scare us to dive into it, but hey, the Bible is true. It does not hurt to just maybe go in with an open mind and an open heart. You never know what will be unfolding for you. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think we can finish on a better note than that. So thank you again, Sage, so much for coming on. Everybody, please go check out Sage's channel, like, subscribe. I know you'll find it fascinating. I certainly did. And you, you're doing a lot of original work too, which I think is really cool. You're like exploring topics that I haven't seen explored before. And so I really appreciate that. So I think we're going to say bye for now. And uh, thank you again. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Have a great one.